We're back with PSG and Chief Investment Officer Greg Hopkins, who's going to take us through a little bit about the process and where he's seeing value offshore. Greg, thanks for joining us. It's amazing, uh, you know, we have, uh, I don't know how many analysts looking at some of those large cap companies, you know, and, and you guys are sitting in Cape Town. Is it the case of some of the domestic investors in Europe can't see the wood from the trees? And what, or is it a case of you seeing something from Cape Town that uh, no one else is seeing? Tell me how hard it is to invest in these companies when you're not actually in those geographies. And I think that's, that's a great point. And the, 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 the term you use, you know, looking up, trying to see the wood for the trees, Warren Buffett actually made a very, very good example of this, uh, writing in his annual report of 2011, when he actually said that um, IBM, um, and he was referring to IBM, and he said he'd been reading the IBM annual report every year for 50 years. Right. And it wasn't until 2011, sitting in his office in Omaha on a Saturday morning, that his thinking crystallized. And he said the scales fell off his, it's almost as if the scales fell off his eyes. And he quoted a, a, a philosopher called Thoreau, and he said, it's not what you look at that's important, it's what you see. And we think we have quite a nice advantage sitting in Cape Town in terms of looking from the outside in. It's not what you look at, it's what you see. And each opportunity that comes up, you know, we typically will receive the same information. Um, we don't think there's a huge information advantage, not or disadvantage of sitting in Cape Town versus the global, uh, you know, sitting in London or, or, or New York. But we think that we have an opportunity to sift through that, no, no, that, that noise, sift through that information, um, read those annual reports, and it's not what you look at, it's what you see. And we think we're actually quite good at doing that from Cape Town. We've been investing in offshore equities since 2006 uh, from Cape Town, the same team, same process. Um, it gives us, um, that's quite unique in South Africa, and it gives us quite a good advantage because we've actually built up quite a big database now of uh, global opportunities. You, you, you quoted Buffett there. Let, let's just keep that. I think we've got a lot of retail investors, and I know there's, there's some uh, viewers that are obviously invested in your funds, but this is quite an interesting uh, uh, point just to dwell on. You sit outside of many of these geographies when you're investing offshore. Uh, you know, we talk about this informational advantage or disadvantage. Do you get a lot from going and visiting the management of companies? Is that part of, part of your process? Or, you know, how do you sort of weigh that with being able to do that locally versus perhaps not being able to go and see the, the chief executive of Tesco's, for instance? Yeah, and I think um, it's actually interesting. And, you know, 15 years ago, it would have been very difficult. Um, technology has shifted dramatically, especially in communication. So we can sit in Cape Town and we can watch the IBM or the Tesco Analyst Day. Um, typically a high quality, high, high um, a very informational type of uh, you know, investor day where they actually go through the whole business, in normally five or six hours. And we're sitting in Cape Town, we can actually, it's almost like we're there. Um, so you get access to management and to the investment case or the opportunity you're looking at through the webcasts, through conference calls and that sort of stuff. So we do have management contact. We generally spend less time face to face with management. Um, you go and invest in the US and you spend time with an American CEO, you typically always invest in the company. They're very, very good at actually selling themselves. So we'd like to be also part of stepping away from that right. is to be more objective. So we evaluate management's track records. We've got a very uh, simple checklist that we use, which is our middle M, the management. Um, we, we use quantitative approach, but we also use qualitative approach in terms of evaluating what typically management's key role is in terms of capital allocation. And you can do that sitting in Cape Town. Uh, but we will get the information as of any other investor by, you know, by, you know, by listening to webcasts and the like. Okay, so th this point that we raised about the three M's, you, specifically what does that refer to? So our three, M's are, it's, it's, our three M's are a simple checklist that we use to filter through the information when we're sitting in Cape Town. Okay. Um, we, we talk about our, our moats, management margin of safety. So the moats are your business model. We're looking for high quality businesses, competitive advantages. We spend a lot of time on that. I think that's probably the, 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 the most important part of our overall you know, analysts um, you know, in terms of our, 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 our research process. Okay. The second M is the management team. Uh, managements are stewards of our capital. It's interesting, a lot of investors don't quite, haven't quite worked that out. I think uh, you know, in terms of, they give, us, uh, they give us money in our retail, retail funds, we take that money, we actually give it to the management teams of the companies we invest in. They become stewards of capital on our behalf and our investors. So it's very important that you understand um, you know, management's track record, their ability, how ethical they are, um, you know, and, and understanding how they've actually made decisions in the past. And the third uh, is called, you know, what we refer to as a margin of safety. We're looking for that asymmetry. Little downside, lots of upside. Okay, so that's the, very much the PSG process there. I wanted to just ask you some questions around uh, global banks. 
Barclays. You know, Anthony Jenkins at Barclays, I think he's busy cleaning shop as we yes. speak here today. We saw the EPSA results, a little bit disappointing. Uh, big reputational issue around global banks at this yes. point, especially if you look at the investment banks and even some of the large retail banks. Uh, how, how big is the opportunity there for you? We think it's a big opportunity. And just interestingly enough, across our domestic portfolios, we own no South African banks. Uh, we own offshore banks. Um, so we've got, we, we typically focused more in, in terms of Europe and, and to a lesser degree, uh, sorry, more in terms of US and lesser degree uh, Europe. So if you look across to the US, um, the US has been through a massive um, sort of, in, there's been a lot of introspection. The guys have been, you know, especially the US bank managers have been cleaning their banks. Um, they've gone through, which, which was, a, was a massive shock to the system through the global financial crisis. Um, so you've actually seen a situation where these banks have actually been writing off bad loans, uh, been making good loans, they've actually tightened up their credit uh, policies, and they've actually been strengthening, up their, strengthening their balance sheets. And what's been happening behind the scenes as well is that the US housing market is starting to bottom and starting to recover, which is going to be very good, we think, for, you know, it will be a tailwind rather than a headwind uh, in terms of future earnings growth. So we look at a company like JP Morgan, um, it's a global bank, it's based in the US, it's got a long, a large US franchise, but it's a global bank. Uh, it's got trillions of dollars of, of assets on its balance sheet. We think the opportunity set in that type of opportunity is huge. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of, of um, you know, sort of extraordinary charges that they're taking at the moment as they're cleaning up their, 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 their balance sheet. There's some litigation that's still, you know, pending from the crisis, but as that works its way through the earnings, you'll see that the earnings power of those banks are actually a lot higher than a lot of people are looking for, which creates that margin of safety. You've mentioned JP Morgan and a very competent uh, CEO and Jamie Dimon. Yes. Uh, they've, they've suffered the effects, even they got dragged into the financial crisis and, and some risky bets in there yes. uh, with the London Whale in their investment office. Contrast that against Citibank, which I th think you could probably say shot a little bit more from the hip. Yes. Uh, how do you sort of make a preference with these gigantic banks between a call between, say, Citibank, for instance, and a, and a JP Morgan? Is it almost just valuation, or do you kind of look at the, the management and the culture as well and say, well, we're more happy sitting with a JP Morgan than perhaps some of the other investment banks? Yeah, I, I think that you've got to look at track record and culture. Um, Citigroup has, has, got a, has got a long history of always, you know, there's, a, there's an analogy people use that when you have a financial crisis, it's almost like the bomb goes off in the, in the, in the, in the dam and you see who comes floating to the top. And typically, typically every, every, after every crisis, Citigroup normally comes close to the top. You know, it's, it's a bank that has had a history of, of poor capital allocation. And that, that counts in, against them in our, in our mind. Uh, if you look at JP Morgan, they've actually played the financial crisis very well. They were on the front foot. They bought a lot of banks. Um, they managed to you know, take market share. They've been investing heavily when other banks have actually been disinvesting. Um, so they've come through, the strong has come through, have come through stronger. They're on the front foot. Citigroup are still trying to clean themselves up. You know, it, it could be a good opportunity in the future. We just think on a risk return basis, uh, it's, it's probably less attractive than a, than a company like JP Morgan. And just turning your attention to global investment banks, Goldman Sachs, I mean, these are, these are banks you can buy if you want to overseas, Goldman Sachs, Deutsche Bank. Uh, you know, does that intrigue you at all? Is it still a little bit too risky or too unknown to invest in some of those uh, bulge bracket uh, firms? We, um, we think the bulge bracket firms are going to be potentially a little bit challenged in the future. Um, JP Morgan's got an investment bank within, its, within its, its broader global franchise. So we are exposed to the global banking or the investment banking cycle. But um, we prefer to be in the more the boutique uh, type investment banks, smaller, um, uh, you know, strong culture type owner managed uh, investment banks uh, where we think this, this, this opportunity in the MA cycle, which has actually been quite a poor area to be in the last couple of years, will be very attractive in the future. It'll drag Goldman Sachs along with it, but we'd rather be playing in the sort of the mid and tier and smaller tier um, investment banks, um, which we think will actually be a lot more nimble and will have a much better opportunity in that space. If you look at the big opportunity set that's out there at the moment, interest rates are very, very low. Uh, evaluations, especially in the US, are very, very attractive. Uh, there's a big gap between, you know, say the earnings yield of some of these companies and the, and the interest rates that they can borrow at in terms of the, 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 the bond yields, so, so to speak, across the, the sector. And that's going to create an M&A uh, opportunity for a large number of companies. We're starting to see it already. Um, so these investment banks will be able to exploit it. We just prefer to play it on the, on the, small, in the smaller cap names within that space. Okay. Just a final question. You, you run some of the balance portfolios offshore. Very hard to, uh, to try and find yield. Well, what are you doing in the fixed income space? Uh, what are you able to do in the fixed income space at this point to try and uh, find yield in, in your allocation to fixed interest? We, we typically um, 
we run a domestic balance uh, balance fund. Offshore, we don't run uh, balance funds, but um, it, it doesn't. I mean, if we actually look out across the pond in terms of uh, fixed income opportunities offshore, we feel that uh, um, there's significant risks in terms of investing global bonds. We think you know interest rates are at not only at generational lows, but you know. 300 year lows, I guess, in, in certain parts of the market. Um, we think that exposes investors to, the, you know, the, the risk of, of losing capital over the next, uh, you know, the next few years. So we'd be staying away from banks, uh, from uh, fixed income type instruments, from bonds, um, and any interest rate, you know, sort of more driven type type opportunities. But um, that's not to say that there's um, there's not opportunities in certain, you know, parts to exploit a rising interest rate in market. And some of your banks will, do, will be able to do that. Some of the more uh, value type companies within, um, you know, the global environment will benefit from rising interest rates. And that's where we're finding opportunities. So stay away from bonds, invest in equities, and potentially, uh, if you'd like to play those type of opportunities that will benefit from rising interest rates, which we think is, is, is you know, is a high probability event over the next five years.